Well, my paper is uh, concentrated on Mexico-U.S. relations, and since the previous panel was a more general overview of both South Africa and Brazil, I will say a few words regarding Mexico as a regional power, more in general, and then I will turn into Mexico-U.S. relations because it is a good example to question the capacity of Mexico of becoming a regional power, staying one, or finding a place in the world. What I would like to say regarding Mexico as a regional power, middle power, emerging power, mid power, or whatever concept you want to use in terms of locating Mexico somewhere in the world, I have to say that Mexico cannot be compared to Brazil, or perhaps South Africa, I know the, the, the South African case in, in less detail, because it has been a continuous struggle to become one. Mexico was considered or per perceived itself as a middle power in the 70s, 80s, when the Central American conflict was at its worst in, in, in the region. And ever since, it has been like an, um, a continuous um, struggle to find the place. Our rivalry with Brazil has a lot to do with that, you know, in terms of who's the, the regional leader. But the truth is, you cannot say that Mexico has been a regional leader for a long time, especially since NAFTA. You know, NAFTA meant, you know, choosing one side, not entirely, but very importantly. And the region is therefore there when it is needed, but then if it's not needed, the region is not there. So I, I would like to, to start with that because we cannot sort of assess the, the place or the role of Mexico as a regional leader taking it for granted. It has been a struggle. It has been in the interest of Mexican for, uh, governments since 2000, more or less, not this one, both governments, uh, both pan governments and the last pre-government, but it has not been like a very well thought and traditionally sought objective such as the Brazilian case. That's, that's um, I think, um, very clear. And now I will turn into Mexico-US relations under President Trump because, well, because it's interesting in itself, but also because it can say a lot about what Mexico can and cannot do in the region and in the international system. As you all know, Trump has used Mexico strategically to advance his electoral objectives, appealing to a large segment of U.S. population unsatisfied and disappointed for its disadvantaged economic and social position. Uh, Mexico became a very useful instrument to blame for that um, discontent. NAFTA became, in the words of Trump, the worst trade agreement ever signed by the United States for its allegedly negative consequences for the U.S. economy. And migrants, sometimes Mexicans as such explicitly, were identified as the source of unemployment, violence, and drug trafficking in the United States. Thus, bashing Mexico became a crucial component of America First and making uh, Make America Great Again. Mexico is really very, very useful in terms of Trump's uh, electoral campaign. And now again. The Trump phenomenon, to, to, to call it somehow, coinc coincided with two Mexican presidents, Enrique Peña Nieto from the pre-party and, and the current one, Andrés Manuel López Obrador from Morena movement. This paper will argue that Trump... Trump's ascendancy to power was a disruptive factor in Mexico-U.S. relations that questioned the basic tenets of the bilateral relationship, although it is too soon to conclude whether we are witnessing a temporary storm or the beginning of a new bilateral relationship. Traditionally, Academics have considered that the United States' main interest regarding Mexico is domestic stability. The U.S. doesn't care who, Mexico go who, 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 who governs Mexico as long as this elite in power can maintain stability in the country. And make on a secure border. It's Mexican stability and, of course, a secure border. We can discuss what a secure border means, but that's basically what the United States has, has pursued in the case of Mexico. And in turn, Mexico's aim has been to preserve its sovereignty as well as spaces for autonomy and independence. Um, although not entirely new, 
except for its magnitude, the fact that Mexico became a key subject in Trump's electoral campaign caught Peña Nieto's government completely unaware, and it reacted by explicitly responding to his provocations, but also by trying to accommodate his interests. López Obrador, in turn, has assumed an attitude of not confronting the United States. It is not clear, however, whether not confronting means disregarding Trump's declarations, defending Mexico's interests without engaging in a verbal war, or yielding to his demands. What is clear is that a symmetry, which has been there always and it will always be there, is once again openly manifested. After a period of good management of the bilateral relationship, what we can call the NAFTA era, crude realism becomes prominent again, speaking about geopolitics like in the last um, panel. The United States is now concerned on a secure border and what Trump understands as fair trade. Um, domestic stability does not seem to be a crucial goal as before. Mexico's struggle for sovereignty, autonomy, and independence defines, defines as clearly as ever its policy towards its northern neighbor. The presentation will be divided into three main sections. Uh, first, Peña, then López Obrador, and in the end, a world, a world, a word of uh, Mexico's foreign policy more general, without invading um, Fidel's um, topic, to evaluate or assess the idea of Mexico as a regional power. So the first part concerns Peña Nieto's governments, and it's entitled Walls and Bridges Between Mexico and the United States. And the main analytical points are asymmetry, again, in the attacks by, by Trump towards the Mexican government, and a very important um, strategy, which is unilateralism, reasserting, of course, the United States sovereignty. Mexico then, in, in turn, turned to nationalism and negotiations under pressure. Defending sovereignty became one of Peña Nieto's main objectives. So, to start analyzing U.S.-Mexico relations under Trump, one has to look to, to the, um, at the NAFTA era and see how, in a way, with, a, with many conflicts and many disputes between the two countries, the NAFTA era had something characteristic which was like a good disposition by both governments to solve those disputes. To solve disputes, to identify common interests and to support the idea of these common interests. Um, the way in which Mexico became part of the U.S. electoral campaign in 2015, however, although not a new phenomenon, Mexico had been part of the U.S. electoral campaigns many, for many, many, uh, on many occasions, signaled the end of the NAFTA era. First, because Trump wanted to modify or exit NAFTA. One of the first proposals by Trump was to say, we are going to exit NAFTA and we don't want NAFTA anymore. Um, and if the U.S. Congress ratifies the new treaty, the USMCA, NAFTA will be history. And so will be the NAFTA era. The first, the, the, first, the main contention issue between Trump and Peña Nieto's government was the construction of a border, in the, uh, of a border wall to be paid by Mexico, and the renegotiation or end of NAFTA. Trump's rhetoric was violent, and his proposals indicated that the United States' traditional interest in Mexico stability was no longer so. In Trump's view, a wall would eliminate immigration and drug trafficking together with violence, thus disregarding the damage done to all border transactions and the profound effect that the end of free trade would have in Mexico's economy and therefore in Mexico's politics. Mexican politics, moreover, were not important to him. That is to say, the capacity of the government to maintain stability in the country. Mexico reacted you know, in two ways. First, entirely being reactive and defensive by strongly rejecting the idea of the wall and obviously assuring and reassuring once again, once and again, that Mexico would never pay for it, defending its migrants, but at the same time approaching Trump. 
approaching Trump was seen by Mexican public opinion as contradicting a nationalist response, humiliating and unacceptable. Trump's visit to Mexico, the culmination of this strategy, was very costly in terms of Peña Nieto's popularity and of the government's relations with then-candidate Hillary Clinton. Moreover, it was not understandable for many international and domestic analysts. The issue of the wall has not been solved. Trump insisting that it will be built and Peña reassuring everyone that Mexico would never pay for it. The wall was even responsible for the cancellation of two meetings between Peña and Trump. In January 20, 2017, shortly after Trump ordered its construction, and in February 2018, after a telephone conversation in which Trump reiterated the Mexican president that the wall will be built. As Mexican migrants were targeted and insulted, and massive deportations appeared as a real possibility, the Mexican government implemented a strategy to support and protect Mexican undocumented migrants in its more than 50 consulates in the United States. Protection of migrants and repatriated Mexicans became a foreign policy priority. Symbolically, the idea of a wall suggested that Trump didn't perceive Mexico as a partner or an ally at all, even when Mexico is an essential actor for U.S. security. Regarding NAFTA, both presidents reached an agreement to renegotiate it in August 2018, even when the United States had already imposed tariffs on Mexican steel and aluminum, together with Canada and the European Union. That is to say, Mexico was not the only target in this case. Uh, many countries were um, targeted by U.S. policy. Mexico retaliated and imposed tariffs in products such as pork meat, apples, potatoes, cheese, and others. But after a year, a treaty was signed, not a free trade treaty because Trump considered that the concept of free trade was not acceptable. And among the things that changed was those um, the chapter on the automobile sector and it changed very much in, in terms of what Trump desired uh, which was to take car production back to the United States. The new agreement indicates that 75% of automobiles must be manufactured in the United States and Mexico and between 40 and 45% of its contents has to be produced by workers earning at least 16 US dollars per hour. That has to be the United States and Canada. Mexico cannot pay that minimum uh, wage. On the other hand, the sunset clause, which was the idea of the treaty having a specific the date of end, um, pushed by the United States very, very strongly, was not included. <laughs> the trade pact will be revised every six years to extend its lifetime by 16 more. If, when it is reviewed, there is no agreement on certain topics, there will be an annual revision. <laughs> an equilibrium, in consequence, an equilibrium between a nationalistic defense and engagement with Trump was never reached. The general perception towards the end of Peña Nieto's presidential term was that of a humiliated Mexico, despite a relatively successful trade negotiation, no wall at the border, and no massive deportation of migrants. Jared Kushner, receiving Mexico's highest honor for four years in November 2018, a week before Peña Nieto left office, was not well received by Mexican public opinion. In this way, to the presidency and as president, in his way to the presidency, sorry, and as president, Trump did not seem interested in Mexico's stability. He does not seem to have considered the very destabilizing consequences of ending free trade with Mexico, deporting migrants, and attacking the governments. The one major objective was to seal the border. The only way he thought would bring security was, of course, the wall. Symbolically and in practice, it meant to take distance from Mexico. As always, Mexico continued to defend its sovereignty and to look, for, to look for margins of maneuver, but the struggle was harder than it had been for many years, reacting to major direct threats. Asymmetry and U.S. unilateralism characterized Peña's last years in power. The idea of bilateralism faded, and the idea of bilateralism was very much a, a core concept in the NAFTA era. We can have problems, we can have disputes, but we have a bilateral relationship and we have to solve them bilaterally, with a few exceptions. 
The second section of the presentation is called Peace and Love. Um, and the main analytical points are, again, a symmetry in unilateralism and the idea of the bilateral relationship being comp compartmentalized or decompartmentalized compartmentalized, sorry, I can't pronounce that word, or whether there is submission in terms of Mexico's position. But at the same time, it is, it is interesting that maybe when, Lop, when with Lopez Obrador, despite his non-confrontational policy, we are returning to a bilateral relationship. I think it's too soon to say, but there are signs that we may be again engaging the United States, which is, of course, um, a very um, risky thing to say because Trump anytime can change everything with just one tweet. In the context of tensions with the United States, candidate Lopez Obrador wrote Trump a letter expressing his willingness to develop a courteous bilateral relationship and informing him of some of his policies to reduce migration, Mexican and Central American, to the United States. Trump answered positively, even declaring that he would do better with López Obrador than with Peña Nieto. And I quote Trump, I like Mexico. I like his new leader. I believe he could be great. A little different from us, <laughs> but I believe that it will, go be it will go better with him than with a capitalist one, that is Peña Nieto. He, AMLO, knows Mexico needs the United States. End of the quote. In effect, López Obrador has implemented a, a new strategy towards Trump, although not necessarily towards the United States. It has been a, 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 a sort of parallel policy, one towards the person and one towards the country. López Obrador has been very cautious in, responding, in in responding to Trump's direct attacks on Mexico and the Mexicans, especially regarding the issue of the wall. After threatening to close the border if Mexico did not stop the flow of migrants crossing into the United States, López Obrador answered that he preferred love and peace, his words. He added that Mexico would not confront the government of the United States and would implement a good neighbor policy, a policy of friendship. His strategy would be to act with great prudence. So far, this strategy seems to have worked in terms of not escalating a verbal war. When López Obrador does not re respond, Trump is disarmed. Thus, this is the opposite of what happened during Peña's government. The verbal war was really, really strong between Peña and Trump. Verbal exchanges became part of the bilateral relationship, but not with López Obrador. However, what are the facts revealing about contemporary Mexico-U.S. relations? Regarding trade, the USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada agreement, was already signed when López Obrador took office, but it was only weeks ago when the Mexican Congress ratified it. It is now the US Congress' turn to do so, and the Mexican government is working hard with US domestic actors to achieve that goal in a Democrat-majority Congress. Despite the fact that the USMCA seems to be on track, the issue of tariffs has not gone away. The US government canceled tariffs on steel and aluminum in May 2019, but it imposed tariffs on Mexico tomato in May and lifted them disadvantageously for Mexico in August. It has just imposed last week 35% tariffs on structural steel. This means that trade is not a problem for Trump, but free trade is. Immigration for the Mexican government, for many academics, for many analysts, is a bilateral phenomenon, but not for Trump. And this is part of the differences between the two countries. Despite the anti-immigration environment created by Trump, Shortly after his inauguration, López Obrador announced a new Mexican approach towards immigration that would underline the human rights of migrants and would discard the criminalization perspective. López Obrador immigration policy would also include a comprehensive development plan for southern Mexico and, Cel and Central America's northern triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, consistent with his view that forced or involuntary migration would cease by promoting development. Cons consistent with this new approach, thus, 
Early in his government, López Obrador promised Mexico would give humanitarian visas to undocumented migrants arriving from Central America and other parts of the world that would allow them to live and work in Mexico, but more importantly, to reach freely the U.S.-Mexico borders. Even before that, the Mexican government under Peña and some and perhaps before, always used to give undocumented migrants an exit permit. So they would not be deported from Mexico, they would be let go free to the Mexico-US uh, border. In a way, although in not this word, without these words, López Obrador signaled an open-door policy that multiplied the numbers of migrants arriving in Mexico on the way to the United States. U.S. authorities were obviously not happy with this policy that significantly increased migrant crossings or attempted crossings to the United States. Thus, in February 2019, the Mexican government radically changed its policy and reduced the number of visas and permits given to undocumented migrants. The Ministry of Interior even announced a contention plan and started deporting a great number of migrants. In April, Mexican authorities deported around around 45,000 migrants. According to analysts, specialists in the subject, Mexican authorities were overwhelmed by the number of migrants arriving in Mexico and were under strong pressure from the United States to stop northbound immigration. The U.S. government would not only push Mexico towards a more restrictive immigration policy, but it actually implemented domestic measures with bilateral consequences. Since, Decem since December 2018, the U.S. government notified Mexico the application of Section 235B2C of its Immigration and Nationality Law, by which the United States will return non-Mexican asylum seekers to Mexico to wait until their legal processes were completed. Mexico had no option but to accept this remain in Mexico policy, and it justified it as a sovereign decision and for humanitarian reasons in accordance with its new humanitarian approach to immigration. The most openly dramatic U.S. pressure on Mexico was Trump's threat to once again impose tariffs on all Mexican exports to the United States, regardless of NAFTA, which as of today is still in force. Until the U.S. MCA is not ratified, NAFTA is the treaty in force. If Mexico did not stop migrants crossing to the United States. Tariffs, tariffs would be gradually imposed from 5% up to 25%. Mexican authorities rushed to Washington, literally rushed to Washington, to negotiate before any tariff was imposed, and an agreement was reached in June 2019. Mexico agreed to stop crossing in its, uh, crossings in its northern neighbor by sending the National Guard to both the northern and the southern borders. Mexico would also increase the number of deportations of undocumented migrants. Mexico and the United States would assess the situation after 45 days, still considering the possibility of the imposition of tariffs and of asking that Mexico became a safe third country. This means a safe third country means that all asylum seekers would have to ask to apply for asylum in the first country they enter after leaving their own country. So if they had to cross through Mexico, they had to apply for asylum in Mexico and not in the United States. And this has been unacceptable for the Mexican um, government. Um, when the deadline arrived, Mexican Secretary Ebrard very proudly announced that the flow of migrants crossing towards the United States had declined in 36%, so that the issue of the safe third country was not on the negotiating table, table anymore. In his talks with Secretary Pompeo on that occasion, it was July, Ebrard asked the U.S. government to reinstall the repatriation program for Mexican immigrants cancelled in 2018 and to collaborate in fighting the illegal arms trafficking from the United States to Mexico. There has been no news regarding these requests. The United States gave Mexico another 45 days to assess again the situation, that is actually today. Today, the Mexican minister is in Washington to assess the results of the immigration agreement for the second time, and last Friday, he announced that the flow of immigrants has been reduced by 56%. Power asymmetry, as you can see, is more evident now in Mexico-U.S. In Mexico relations 
as perhaps the worst days in the bilateral relationship in history. The question is whether Mexico is yielding to U.S. pressures or whether the fact that it could negotiate and maintain the, relation, the relationship decompartmentalized, separated, that one issue would not contaminate the other issue, reflects certain margin of action and thus an, and probably an barely successful foreign policy. The fact that Mexico has not agreed to become a safe third country, which has been Trump's objective all along, may give some credit to the Mexican government. Depending on what today's meeting results are, we may even talk about an understanding between the two countries, not a balanced one since Mexico has indeed given up more than the US, but at least an understanding that keeps the bilateral relationship on track. The idea of an understand if the idea of an understanding is true, Lopez Obrador's government may have returned to bilateralism, despite Trump's unilateral actions that support the U.S. approach that immigration is a strictly domestic affair and the U.S. government is free to do as it pleases. Thus, so far, we may argue that in the face of Trump's unilateral actions, crudely illustrating the asymmetry of power between the two countries, Mexico has been successful to at least maintain the bilateral nature of the, of the relationship. Trump may not be interested in Mexico's stability, but he is so very much in a secure and sealed border. Mexico has agreed giving up independence and autonomy, especially with this new approach towards immigration, perhaps sovereignty, ironically in trying to preserve it. And just a word you, to, to end up with a discussion about this Mexico being a regional power. Speaking more broadly of, of uh, Mexican foreign policy, we seem to find a parallel diplomacy. The first is really a non-diplomacy, which is person personified by López Obrador, and this reminds me of the discussion of, of iso on isolation that we had in the last uh, panel. Uh, but López Obrador doesn't know and doesn't care about foreign policy. He's not really... It, foreign policy is really not in the interest of López Obrador. But at the same time, we have the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who is implementing a more active foreign policy with the United States as a reaction to Trump's policies, of course, but also in the multilateral arena, trying to fulfill domestic objectives. And this is very important if we consider the discussion about original power. It's not the same as in, the Peña, as in Peña's years or the years of the PAN when Mexico wanted to be a leader in multilateral initiatives and efforts. It's trying to use what the multilateral sphere has to offer Mexican-specific problems. Climate change, human rights, sustainable cities, etc. So there is not this idea of Mexico projecting itself in the multilateral sphere, but the multilateral sphere being of service of Mexican uh, interests. But overall, however, there is no open or explicit intention to make Mexico a global player, or as Peña's government put it, an actor with global responsibility, with the exception perhaps of the UN Security Council, which I think we will be joining in 20. 21, 22, if I'm correct. Is Mexico behaving like a regional power or an emergent power? But more importantly, can Mexico be a regional or emergent power? I would say not at all to the first two questions, whether he, it is behaving like a regional or emergent power. There is no clear strategy towards the Latin American region. Fidel will surely speak about Venezuela. And less so towards other regions in the world. The question, however, is whether, given the nature of U.S.-Mexico relations, Mexico can be a regional or emergent power. More theoretically speaking, can a country structurally placed like Mexico be a regional or emergent power? This would argue that the more dependent Mexico becomes of the United States, the more the need to diversify its foreign policy and implement an act active policies towards other regions or in diverse topics of the international agenda. Thus, power asymmetry may be the source of an active foreign policy. A second hypothesis would argue that given the intensity of the U.S.-Mexico relationship under Trump, Mexico has no margin of maneuver, and it is preferable not to have an active foreign policy in order not to provoke the United States. The truth surely lies in within these two extremes. But so far, Mexican policy seems to be leaning more towards the latter because of Trump, 
but also because of Mexican governing elite not interested in becoming in, in Mexico becoming an international player. Domestic variables again. Structural factors may not be fatal. We need also domestic factors to, to decide whether Mexico can be or not a regional power. For lack of interest or capacity, Mexico seems to be concentrating its foreign policy on the United States without a clear view of what the rest of the world may mean in terms of defending national interests. Thank you very much.